Lord. And uh, this morning, we want to begin a new teaching series that will run through uh, the summer. And uh, it's hot summer topics. And we, we thought we wanted to talk about some, some uh, hot topics that are out there in our media, in our world. And at times, the church... Uh, can sometimes shy away from some of these difficult topics, but I believe the church uh, has something to say amidst some uh, interesting times in our world, and the scriptures are where we need to go. Now, we all have certain backgrounds, and uh, we've been taught certain things, and uh, we've had certain influencers in our life. Uh, we hear all sorts of uh, ideologies in the media and that could be a lot of information that could be kind of confusing, especially when it comes to the topic of racial reconciliation. Uh, I don't need to tell you or remind you of the tension in our world that exists related to ethnicity and the diversity of, our, of ethnicity in our world. And it has created all sorts of uh, conversations and challenges and uh, we see it widespread in the media, whether it's newspapers or CNN and so on. And, and this morning, what I want us to do is to take all of our own um, understanding, our, 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 the voices in our lives that have maybe directed us a certain way, and, and I want us to bring our thoughts and our beliefs and our values to the word of the Lord today. In fact, that's a habit that we should always have, shouldn't we? To have a biblical worldview is critical to our lives, where we bring our thoughts, our understandings to the word of the Lord and let the word of God form our actions, our next steps, our beliefs. And so that is my prayer uh, this morning as we deal with this topic. Now, sometimes there's this uh, uh, thought that, you know, racial tensions just really exist in the United States. And Canada is this peaceful place where those racial tensions are not high at all. But I'm thinking that that's not so. Uh, just this week, I was uh, seeing a, I read a, a, news, a news report come up of a gentleman who was enjoying his Starbucks latte uh, in Vancouver and uh, he was talking to a friend in his foreign language, and a few gentlemen were tired of hearing a foreign language. And so they abruptly confronted this man with his friend for talking a language other than English. This was this week, friend, in Vancouver in a Starbucks, and confronted him to the point of saying some very nasty words towards him, and then to the point of literally physically assaulting the man. That's in Canada. You see, friends, we need to talk about this, don't we? And some of you in this very room know what it's like to be mistreated because of maybe your country of origin or the language or the accent that you have. But this morning, I want to bring all of those emotions and all of our thoughts to the word of the Lord. And I want us to allow the word of the Lord to to teach us as a church, as a Christ follower, as an individual here this morning, how do we respond in a racially tense world? I think it's an important question to consider. You know, I love when I see people of many nations coming together towards a common goal. You know, it's, it's amazing to see countries come together amidst uh, horrible violence in different parts of the world, and yet there are coalitions that are built that, that, that cross ethnically dividing walls, and they join together for a common purpose. That's a beautiful picture. Well, in many ways, the church is God's coalition, and God's coalition is a group of people from all over the world, all over the world. Diversity in terms of its, of its ethnicity, diversity uh, in terms of its social economic backgrounds, diversity. Working together to not taking people down, but rather to take the evil one down and the darkness of his kingdom. And together from all over the world, we get to join our hearts and, and join together towards building the kingdom of God in a very dark world. We're God's coalition under God's authority, to do His work. 
I uh, reflect on Genesis 1, 26 to 27, which is a verse of scripture that I think is really important. In Genesis 1, the word of the Lord says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and the wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So what did God do? So God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God. He created them, male and female, he created them. God created us. We are all image bearers. If you're from Sri Lanka, you are an image bearer of God. If you're from India, you are an image bearer of God. If you're from Europe, you are an image bearer of God. If you're from the Caribbean, you are an image bearer of God. If you're from Africa, you are an image bearer of God. God created us. God is so amazing. He's so creative. He's so diverse in many ways. If we think about the character of God, he's like this massive diamond with millions of edges on it and cuts on it that reflect his glory in a unique way. But that is what the human family is to look like, so unique, so diverse. We are reflections of God himself. We are created in the image of God. So when we look down the aisle and somebody comes from a different place of the world, we say image bearer of God, created in the image of God, to be treasured, to be loved, to be respected. I think of Deuteronomy 10, 18, and you hear the heart of God come through in this passage. It says, he defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow, and he loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. Here's the heart of God. He loves the foreigner among us, and he cares for them. Friends, if we are in Christ today, we are to reflect and act and react as our God would act and react. Boy, sometimes we do better some days than other days, but we need the help of the Spirit. But God's heart is for those that at times societies marginalize. The church of Christ is the one who loves the marginalized because our God loves the one who is a foreigner. In fact, he goes out of his way to ensure that their needs are met. This morning, I want to talk about two churches in the New Testament, the, the, the Galatian church and the Ephesian church. And, you know, we would be uh, naive to think that in the church there is no segregation. There is segregation in the Christian church around the world. In fact, the New uh, Testament points to the church of Galatia, the church of Ephesus, dealing and grappling and wrestling with division related to ethnicity. And sometimes we kind of skip through those passages, but, but the Apostle Paul writes about this very topic, and so we need to go there to learn about what was going on. Let's go to the Galatian church and the racial reconciliation that God was doing there. You see, Peter was a key disciple, wasn't he? He was a leader. In fact, where Peter went, the others followed. Peter was uh, bold, courageous. He, he sometimes spoke a little too much and got himself in trouble. But Peter was a super Jew. I mean, he was the Jew of Jews. And he was a faithful Jew. And he wanted to live uh, below the Jewish laws and be obedient to those laws and, until something radical happens in Acts chapter 10. And if you have your Bibles, I, I encourage you to go there because this was a key turning point to the early church, to Peter's life. Acts chapter 10 is a critical moment in the early church's history, and I believe will speak volumes to us for the church of today. So Peter's this Jew, and so he ministers to the Jewish community. In many ways, he has separated himself from the Gentile community from those non-Jewish communities until something happens in Acts chapter 10. We start in verse 11. It says this, He saw heaven 
opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Well, for a Jew to have this kind of vision, this is mind-blowing. What do you mean? We have food laws around this. That must not be from God. That's what the Gentiles eat, the Jewish. And I'm a super Jew, Peter says, or must have thought. I can't do that. But then look what happens in verse 17. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was, Peter's house was, and stopped at the gate. And so as Peter has this amazing vision that has the potential to completely transform his ministry and change the trajectory of the early church, God is already orchestrating a Gentile family to come knock at his door and saying, Peter, would you come and minister to us? So as Peter's reflecting this vision, he has this Gentile opportunity. And so Peter puts the two to two together and he goes to Cornelius's house. It's an amazing moment. Verse 20, we're going to or 28, we skip down. It says he said to them once he got there, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So this went beyond just food loss. This meant interacting and engaging with the Gentile community. This was earth shattering for Peter. And so he's standing in Cornelius' house and he begins to minister. And he tells them right off the bat, you know, guys, that I shouldn't even be in your house. Jewish customs, and I'm the super of Jews should not allow me to even be in your house, but here am I because I had a vision, and I believe God has directed me to you. Verse 34 says, Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. That is massive. He accepts people from every nation. Peter actually speaks those words to these Gentile folks. And he shares with them. And it's amazing what happens in Cornelius' house. In verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. And the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. For they had heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. And then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of their blessing, baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. Wow. So in that moment, God calls the super Jew, calls Peter through a vision. It's time, Peter, that you stop being segregated and you start walking down the road to that Gentile community whom I love. And I want you to testify of the gospel of Christ. And as he did that out of obedience, the spirit of the Lord even came down on those Gentile followers of Christ. It's a beautiful moment where the segregated lines were deleted in the name of Christ. Now look what happens in chapter 11, verse 2. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, so he was returning back to his Jewish friends, the circumcised, otherwise known as the Jewish community, believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate? With them, you see, any time you take a step to racial reconciliation, there will always be people who will say to you, that's a wrong move. You don't know what this can mean. They might start controlling things. We hear all kinds of comments. Friends, God loves all nations. 
all people. In fact, he created them in the image of God. And he called the super Jew of them all, Peter, who followed the Jewish law to a T. And he said, Peter, it's time to stop criticizing and stop labeling people as unclean or insufficiently prepared for me. You need to go there and actually befriend them and be with them and eat with them and share with them the love of Christ. And so he did and everything changed. However, when he returned to Jerusalem, he felt the backlash. What are you doing, Peter? Do you know what this can mean? It's going to change everything. We won't necessarily be the center of Christianity. We won't, we won't have as much. This could potentially change everything. And so Peter hears this and he speaks to them. He says, no, but guys, I, I saw this vision. And he, he went on and he seemed to convince those that day who had initially criticized him. But, but there is evidence that Peter was torn between the Jewish community and the Gentiles community. This wasn't an easy transition for Peter. You see, the reason why I know and we know that Peter struggled with this tension, even after this encounter in Cornelius' house, we know this because his story spills into the letter written by Paul to the Galatian church. I want you to go to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2 points to something really important. Paul, who writes the church, writes the letter to the church of Galatia, says and confronts Peter. And so we know that although Peter had this wonderful experience at Cornelius' house, he still struggled. And so there is indication that at times Peter would be a good Jew when he was around Jewish people, and he would talk like the Jewish people. In fact, he may even as well still agree with some of the segregation between Jews and Gentiles. But then almost secretly and underground, he would also interact with the Gentile community, and he would make them think and feel like he loved them as well. And he kind of teeter-tottered back and forth. He was trying to wrestle with this difficulty. So because he was going this back and forth, in many ways being hypocritical. Yes, Peter, Paul confronts him with this letter written to the church of Galatia. Look at this, chapter 2, starting in verse 11. When Cephas came to Antioch, when Peter came to Antioch, Paul writes, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James... Before the Jewish friends of James, he came to visit him. He used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back. And he began to separate himself from the Gentiles. Why? Because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group, who belonged to the Jewish community. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy. Paul's not mincing words here, is he? The others joined him, Peter, in in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. Do you see this? Peter, this leader, was even influencing people like Barnabas, who was like an elder in this group of disciples, and, 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 and was influencing him down the wrong road. When I saw, Peter continues, when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel... I said to Cephas, or Peter, in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it, then, that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? So Paul confronts his hypocrisy and says, Peter, you can't fool me. I know you're a strong leader, but I'm just as strong, maybe stronger. And he says, Peter, you had this encounter at Cornelius' house that, yes, changed your life. But you're still wrestling with this racial reconciliation, aren't you? You still feel this, 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 this sense to, to make the Jewish community happy, to not get the backlash from them. And so when you're with them, you speak the right language. You speak the right words. You're in agreement. But then secretly you hang out with Gentiles and you speak the right language to them. You've got to stop the hypocrisy. The fact of the matter 
And he goes on to say in chapter 3 of Galatians, Paul reminds them in verse 8, Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. And he said these words to Abraham, all nations will be blessed through you. And so Paul reminds Peter, Peter, the Abrahamic blessing is not just for one ethnicity. It's for all nations. All nations. All nations. You see, Paul passionately continues advocating for racial reconciliation by reminding the church of, of the extent of the Abrahamic blessing, that all nations will be blessed through you. Paul goes on in, in that same chapter 3 by saying, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Peter, get this right. Church, get this right. We don't need to segregate ourselves, but we are one in Christ Jesus. You see, God is not attempting to melt us all into one pot and lose our ethnic distinctiveness. I don't think that that's what God wants. He created us with those distinctives for a reason, to reflect different parts of his image, of his glory. But rather, he is attempting to position all of us under God's authority amidst our diversity. You see, I am better to be a part of a church that is multi-ethnic. You see, I grew up in a mono-ethnic church. And I got to tell you, there was always this part of me that was discontent with that. And now, years later, God has given me the beautiful privilege to serve a church that is multi-ethnic in nature. It's a beautiful thing, friend, to be part of a congregation like this. I think sometimes we forget about it. Or we take it for granted. It's beautiful to worship with other brothers and sisters from all over the world. And to learn from each other. To learn from our experiences. To learn about our passions and the diversity and, and the uniqueness. Why we're all image bearers of God. So we get to see a different part of the amazing grandeur of our God when we gather together. At the end of the day... The vision of heaven is so beautiful. It's found in Revelations. It's a beautiful vision. Revelation 7, 9, and 10. Don't ever forget this. The vision of heaven. After this, I looked, and there before me was this great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Friend, the picture of heaven is a diverse heaven, not a monoethnic heaven. This is a rehearsal. Every time on Sunday we gather and worship, it is a, just a taste of what heaven is like. And so, we hear the words of Paul saying, get rid of the segregation because one day we're going to end up worshiping God together for eternity, not just for an hour and a half on a Sunday. And so you better get used to it. See, Peter, and if we're honest, many of us, we don't just need a culture-sensitive seminar, although those could be helpful. Maybe what we need is repentance. Maybe what we need is to say, God, I sometimes hold some harsh mindsets towards certain people groups. I have uttered words that I know do not please you. God, help me. You might say, 
my parents taught me this. You know what? If what your parents taught you doesn't line up with the word of God, discard it. If what your parents have taught you lines up to the word of God, hold on to it, my friend. But we all are responsible to go to the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord is very clear on this racial reconciliation point. I just illustrated it through the letter of Galatia and the relationship between Peter and Paul. Paul went to the wall for this. And he confronted one of his fellow teammates and said, Peter, stop being hypocritical. Stop playing the part and start believing in the truth. Get this right. I will clothe you with power so that you could be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. This Abrahamic blessing is for all nations. All nations. Secondly, this morning, I want to go to the letter of Ephesians. Paul continues. Sorry, Paul was an advocate to reaching the Gentile community. The Ephesian church and racial, racial reconciliation. You see, one of the themes in the letter written to the church of Ephesus is the importance of ethnic diversity in the body of Christ. And the reality is that the church exists to impact the practices of heaven onto the earth. Our job is to bring the values of heaven to the earth. Let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Our job is not to bring in simply and advocate simply for our ethnic diversity. Our goal is to bring the values of heaven seen through our ethnic diversity to earth earth the value we bring to the planet is the values of heaven but something extraordinary happens in Ephesians chapter 2 11 to 16 it is one of the most poignant passages of the early church from my perspective knowing that there was this racial tension uh, these predominantly Jewish churches were becoming predominantly Gentile churches and that created all kinds of tension in the early church and so Paul, being an advocate of racial reconciliation, he writes this passage, and it is loaded. Listen to the word of the Lord today. It says this, Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, brackets, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ. You Gentiles were excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise. You, had, you were without hope and without God in the world. But now, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That's why I said what I said earlier during communion. The blood of Christ, yes, washes away our sin, but it also washes those dividing lines of ethnicity. He brings us under one authority because of Christ. Then he goes on to say, for he himself is our peace. Who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall. We've heard a lot about walls lately. He destroys the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. Now listen. His purpose, God's purpose, was to create in himself one new humanity. Get that. We are part of the human family. Yes, we look diverse, but we're one family out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He's speaking about this wall, this barrier. Many scholars have, have said that the temple of the Lord had 
a variety of different courts in it. There was firstly the outermost court. The furthest layer away from the very presence of God where only the high priest was allowed to go. You know who was allowed in the outermost courts? The Gentiles. Gentiles, we've got a great spot for you. You're in the nosebleeds. You're way out there. Then we're going to build a wall. And then the next layer of people is all the women. All the, the court of women would come. That's your spot. Then we'll build another wall. And then the third layer is the court of Israelites, the people of God, the Jewish community. And then we'll build another wall there. And then we'll finally have the court of priests. The ones who are called and anointed by the Lord, called out to serve the people, they are the only ones allowed in that innermost court. So the people who Paul was writing to in this text understood the courts. They understood the walls and the segregation of those walls. Paul is saying something absolutely earth-shattering. He's saying Christ knocked down those walls. He came in and literally bulldozed those walls. So that every person, Gentile, women, young, old, of all nations, could come and worship Jesus personally, intimately, powerfully. He broke the dividing Wall. It's interesting that in 1877, archaeologists actually found the dividing wall between the outermost court of the Gentiles and the court of women. And do you know what they discovered inscribed at the top of that wall? It said this, do not proceed any further for fear of death. That is not the heart of God. Do not proceed, Gentile, or you may die. Paul writes, he knocked the wall down. He knocked the wall of segregation down. Now, if we are naive to think, that those walls of segregation do not exist in the church today, we're wrong. They do. But I believe God is raising up churches like Heartland for such a time as this. I believe that this is a huge moment in history for the church of Christ to get this right. To show as an example to our communities that are filled with racial tensions of what it could be like if a group of people from all over the world can gather in the same uh, room and worship Jesus. To gather in each other's homes. To actually be friends with each other. The church of Christ has a huge opportunity and calling to be the example in a racially charged world. Would you agree? There are denominations that were birthed because of racial tension. In 1787, the Methodist Episcopal Church, a beautiful church, a beautiful denomination, but it experienced segregation in 1787. When an African man decided to worship and kneel on a white-only section. He was removed from the worship space. And because of that, all of his African brothers left with him. And they started a new movement, a new denomination. The African Methodist Episcopal Church. That is not the heart of God. You see, one of the privileges I have, even in our city, is to be a presbyter to the churches in our region for our denomination, the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. And I've been burdened by this one piece as well. 
The majority of the churches that I'm honored to pray with and support, along with our district leaders, many of them are ethnically based. And so we gather on a Sunday morning in a variety of different locations right throughout our region. But many times we gather not in diversity, but in our mono-ethnic culture. And I understand why. There has, the Church of Canada has done a, not a not so good job of building bridges to those from other nations. And so they've chosen to go on their own. And then those churches also have sometimes struggled to, 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 to engage with the broader Church of Canada. And so we've got this segregation. And God wants us to get used to worshiping together because in Revelations it tells us we're going to be doing that forever. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said something that disturbs me but may be true. He said the 11 o'clock hour on Sunday mornings is sometimes the most segregated hour of the week. May that not be so. And that's why I love our church. That's why, friends, we should never take for granted this beautiful church called Heartland Christian Church. A church that is so diverse, that is so beautiful in its diversity, that is so unified amidst its diversity. That's the heart of God. And as we pray, God, increase our influence. Friends, our dream on Canadian Place, what a beautiful name. Canadian place. Ever think of that? A place where people from all nations gather to worship God. It's a vision that's so much more than bricks and mortar, friends. It's a vision that positions this church to once again influence people from all over the world, from every socioeconomic background and every ethnicity worshiping Whether you are black or white, Hispanic or Asian, Baptist or Pentecostal, whether you have an outgoing personality or an ingrown personality, there's only one color that matters. That's the color red. The precious blood of Jesus. The precious blood of Jesus. Worship team, would you come? You know, I, we, as you know, are part of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. And I don't always mention that. But we are blessed to be part, and I'm blessed to be part of such a wonderful denomination. But at its roots, our denomination is more of a movement. And in the early 1900s, this movement began with a revival at Azusa Street in Los Angeles. This is the roots of our denomination. And the revival speaks to what we value as Pentecostals here in Canada. A man by the name of William Seymour, an African-American gentleman, came and he began to share the gospel. And there became a revival and people from all over the world came to worship with, with William Seymour, who God had called. And what made this revival so unique, yes, was the outpouring of the Spirit that came upon people. But what also made this revival unique, which is the roots of our movement, is that it was a revival of diversity. People of all nations were part of that revival. That's what made the Azusa Street Revival unique, was its diversity. And it was out of that movement that the Pentecostal church was birthed here in our land. It was a movement that's based on the work of the Spirit that unites people of all nations to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, who do not build segregated walls amongst each other, but rather break down the walls that Christ broke down so that it can have influence no matter what your ethnic background is or socioeconomic. That is our root. May we never lose sight of that. Paul tells us, don't lose sight. That Abrahamic blood.
blessing is for all nations.